We which are alive, alive in Christ, alive in righteousness, alive as new creatures in Christ, and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them, shall not precede them, shall not hinder them which are asleep. And then in verse 16 it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, this prophetic, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then in verse 17, glorious translation, it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, will be caught up will be translated, we will ascend, we will go up um, to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Look at verse 18 there. In verse 18 it says, Therefore comfort one another. If we're going to go through the great tribulation, there's no comfort in that. If the abomination of desolation is going to meet us here, there's no, there's no uh, comfort in that. If we're going to go through the same affliction that the people of the world, that the unbelievers, that those who are serving Satan, if they, we're going to go through the same thing with them, there's no comfort in that. But because we're waiting for the coming of the Lord, we're waiting for the rapture. And when the rapture takes place and we're gone, that's only when the devastation, the destruction, the abomination can come upon this world. That's why we have the comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's come back to Mark now, chapter 13, verse 14. In Mark chapter 13, verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. And he's saying, after we have gone, there will be the abomination Abomination of desolation. You know desolation? That's devastation. You know desolation? That's destruction. You know desolation? That's like taking something good, something beautiful, tearing to pieces, making everything to crumble, destroying everything you know, until there is nothing good that people of the world will be living for. It says in Mark chapter 13, verse 14, it says, But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, the very language of Jesus Christ, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The prophet, who is the prophet? A prophet is someone that God reveals what is going to happen to, and he declares that, and because it is a word coming from God, we cannot miss it. It will not be missed. It will happen. And he says, it's spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and it will stand where it ought not. The abomination will stand where it ought not. What does that mean? You see, when you collect something dirty, and you take it to the dustbin, that's uh, taking something that is dirty to a place dedicated for dirty things. But when you take something uh, that is dirty, something defiled, uh, the, the defilement that came out of uh, the animal or uh, 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 came out of man, and then you take that to be in the palace, in the throne of the king of the city. That's abomination. And it is standing and it is being placed where it should not be. And what uh, Daniel was speaking about is that abomination of desolation that should not that is standing where it ought not that means devastation that means abominable things that means what god is when that stands in the temple of god where it should not be when that stands in the throne of the king where it should not be it says then take it and understand what you are reading. Understand that is what Daniel spoke about very quickly. Let's look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. 
and you'll see what uh, Daniel mentioned, and you'll see what Jesus Christ is referring to in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Please open your Bible and underline so that when you read later and when you want to teach other people to you, you will know where the passage is in your Bible. It says, and it shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That one week just means in the original one seven. That is a unit of seven. What does that mean? Actually, seven years. It says, and in the midst of the week, in the midst of the seven, in the middle of those seven years, it shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. You understand that? It will say, there's no other God you are worshipping. There's no other God you are sacrificing to. There's no other God you are praying to. Therefore, stop all that. It will stop the sacrifices of the Jews. It will stop the the offering of the Jews for the overspreading. Listen to this now of the abominations. It will spread dirty things. It will spread evil things, unacceptable things in the on the altar of God. And it says it shall make it desolate. You see that abominations that will make desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. If you look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 3. I've already explained to you that that abomination of desolation is when something dirty, something unacceptable, a, a wicked personality, an evil personality comes to sit at the very altar of the Lord. And he wants to displace God. That's the abomination of desolation in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. You understand? When people are falling away from the truth, and they don't care for the truth, there may be church, but there's no truth. There may be assembly, but there's no truth. And people are used to just telling stories. And they're not used to delving into the Bible, going into the Word of God. And they're used to just hearing whatever the man, the preacher, the priest wants to say. And they say, falling away from the truth. And the people have not heard the truth for so many years. Even when you tell them error, even when you expose them to error, there's, there's nothing they can do because they do not know the difference that time you know is already here in the world that day shall not come except until there come a falling away force and that man of sin that man of sin that's talking about the antichrist that's talking about the tyrant that's talking about satan incarnate that's talking about the one that will totally be controlled by satan and it's a man of sin a man of satan a man of evil it says and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition what will he do what will he do this is the abomination look at verse 4 who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination. When you take that dirty, defiled personality, and then he sits at the very seat of God, and then he calls the people, everyone, to worship him. And if they will not worship him, it will compel them. That's the abomination of desolation. Look at Revelation chapter 13. We're reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 6. It says, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. You see that? There's somebody who comes to uh, the church of the living God. He comes to the seat of the living God. He comes to the throne of the living God. He comes to the altar of the living God. And he opens his mouth against the God of heaven to blaspheme his name and to blaspheme his tabernacle and to blaspheme them that dwell in heaven. 
that's the abomination of desolation. My prayer for you is that you will not be in the world at such a time in Jesus' name. Let me hear your amen. You will not be here at that time in Jesus' name. If you are not going to be here at that time, what's the admonition the Lord is giving us? And what's the Lord telling us how to escape that kind of abomination, that desolation, that destruction, that deception, and that damnation? Uh, we look at Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 15. The admonition for escaping damnation. The admonition for escaping damnation. It tells us in chapter 13 of Mark, verse 15, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of the house. It's talking actually to the people that will be here at such a time. I pray you'll not be here. But you know, as we apply that to ourselves, it's saying that as God has brought you to the mountain top of light, to the mountain top of the gospel, to the mountain top of redemption, to the mountain top of righteousness, to the mountain top of salvation, sanctification, and the power and the strength of the Lord as we see the world crumbling, as we see the world going down the drain, as we see all righteous principles being overturned. You are at the top. Don't calm down. Don't backslide. Don't look down. And don't look behind you. Look at verse 16. It says in verse 16, and let him that is in the field not turn back again to take up his garment. He's saying to the people that will live at that time that if they hear that something has happened in the city, the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem and the Antichrist, the so called find a seat where God ought to occupy and is blaspheming the name of God if they the field. Let them not come back to the place where they were before because affliction was, will start in a devastating, destructive manner. What's that saying to you and to me? Well, the field of evangelism, well, the field of working for God, and we hear that this is happening, this is happening, that's not the time to come back and say, you know, nightclub and drinking and merriment and picnic, because now we know the time is near, and we're not going to allow anything to disengage us and to make us leave the work he has given us today. In verse 17, it says, in verse 17, but what to them that are with charge and to them that give suck in those days. Why is it a crime to have a child, a crime to be pregnant? Not, not at all. He's talking about such a time when the Antichrist will uh, take over and then when food will be measured, when you will not be able to take this and buy this except to take the mark of the Antichrist. And even if you could endure an hunger by yourself, if you could endure the farming by yourself and you say, I will take my stand. What about the baby that is crying all the time? I need something to eat. And if that, if that child is going to get what to eat, then you have to take the mark of the beast. And once you take that mark, it's all over. That means that the destruction will come. That's why it says, be ready now, so you will not be in the world at such a time. My brother, my sister, if there's anything that should occupy our attention, it is being ready at this time. It says in verse 18, in verse 18, it says, and pray that your flight be not in the winter. Your flight be not when it will be so very cold in the land of Israel, and sometimes so cold like the winter, biting cold, that they will not be able to move out, they will not be able to run, even if there is devastation, abomination, even if there is uh, damnation going on, and they wanted to escape, they will not be able to escape, but well, I'm praying for you, you will not be here at such a time. You will be ready in Jesus' name. Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 42. Matthew, Chapter 24, 
beginning from verse 42. It says, watch therefore, watch therefore, watch over your life, watch over the Christian experience you have, watch over the title, and watch over your ticket, and watch over your qualifications, spiritual qualification that will take you to heaven. Don't be so careless and throw it aside and be looking for other things. Watch it therefore, for ye know not what hour the Lord does come. In verse 44, in verse 44, it says, Therefore be ye also ready for such an hour as she think not the Son of Man cometh. Be ye also ready. I pray you'll be ready in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two is the affliction beyond description during the great tribulation. Now, the church is gone. Now, the saints are raptured. Now, the believers have gone from here. And now, the great tribulation is going to happen. And you need to understand, number one, the prophecy of the great tribulation is prophetic. And it is there. And it is unchangeable, unalterable, the prophecy of the great tribulation. Number two is to see the peculiarity of the great tribulation. It will be a peculiar time, a serious time, a time that had never been, a kind of suffering that had never been, that will never be. It's the peculiarity of the great tribulation. Number three is the period. How long will it be? The peculiarity and the period of the great tribulation. Look at uh, Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 19. Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 19. For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, neither shall be. You see what uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said? He said, it will be a time of affliction. Those days, that period, that time uh, will be the time of affliction. And then he qualifies it like this. It says, such as was not from the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time, and neither shall be. Actually, uh, that word, uh, tribulation, is uh, not just something that we uh, cut out. It's not just something that we say, okay, look at this. It will be tribulation. Look at Matthew chapter 24. And you will see what the Lord called it himself. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm reading from verse 21. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation. The language of Jesus, the very words used by Jesus Christ, he said, for then, at that time, for then, after the church is gone, after the church is raptured and caught away and taken away, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not. Since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. No, nor ever shall be. I want you, if you understand the language of graph, it means that you are plotting your graph, and as you draw the graph, it's going down to a peak, and that peak, then if it comes down, there is nothing as high as that peak. What Jesus was saying is that this great tribulation that is coming after the rapture has taken place. If you have heard about the First World War, there were sufferings and there were people that died painful death. If you have heard about the Second World War, there were people that died and the death was devastating. Millions of people died. If you have heard about the collapse of Jerusalem and the temple, AD 70, many people died and the suffering was so much and was so great. It was like people didn't have desire to live. They said, take me out of this place. If you see the ghastly accident and people suffered, if you see somebody who has been sick and the pain is terrible and you say, what else can somebody suffer? This is too much. The Lord is saying uh, the time of the great revelation. It will be a time of suffering. It will be a time of affliction. It will be a time of pain. It will be a time so terrible that it had not happened like that since the beginning of the world until that time. 
no, nor ever shall be. That's the prophecy of the great tribulation in Daniel chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Daniel chapter 12, looking at verse 1. It says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. Jesus called it uh, tribulation. And here now Daniel says in prophetic language, it's a time of trouble. Look at this. Such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered talking about the children of israel a fraction of them a proportion of them a remnant of the children of israel shall be delivered and then it says everyone that shall be found reaching in the book reaching in the book it's talking about the time of the great tribulation what's the peculiarity i read it to you already let's go back to mark chapter 13 Mark chapter 13, and we're looking at verse 19. Mark chapter 13, verse 19, the peculiarity of that great tribulation. You will not be here. You must not be here at that time. Look at the peculiarity. For in those days shall be affliction. What's affliction? That's suffering. What's affliction? That's pain. What's affliction? Destruction. What's affliction? Something that causes untold, unquantifiable pain. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not. From the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, neither shall be. That's the peculiarity. In Joel chapter 2, reading from verse 2, Joel chapter 2, reading from verse 2, Joel the prophet is telling us the same thing. He's saying it will be so peculiar. It is nothing that had never happened. Well, we know that suffering had happened in the world. Uh, the terrible things uh, of uh, sorrow happened in the world. But this will be so peculiar, it had never happened like that before. A day of darkness, that's Joel chapter 2 verse 2. A day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds, a day of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there has not been ever the like. That's the peculiarity. There had not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. The, uh, the peculiarity of the great tribulation is that this is a peculiar suffering. This is particular suffering. And this is special suffering that had never been and will never be. You will not be here at that time in Jesus' name. But you know, it will happen to the whole world. It will cover the whole face of the earth. Uh, look at Zephaniah chapter 1, reading from verse 15. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 15. It says that day is a day of wrath. A day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and des de desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. When you put everything together, trouble, distress, wasteness, desolation, darkness, gloominess, distress, and darkness, you know, it's a terrible time. That's the peculiarity of that time. Look at verse 18 of that Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. It's the day of wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy readers of all them that dwell in the land. Actually, as you look at this, it mentions in that verse, it says it's the time of the Lord's wrath. The time of the great tribulation is the time of 
cross. But let me show you this. We're looking at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. We're looking at verse 12. In Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black. You remember the description of Zephaniah? The sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood. And then in verse 13, in verse 13, it tells us, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And then in verse 14, it says, and the heaven departed as a scroll, that's the sky, the firmament departed as a scroll, and when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Verse 15 now, verse 15 says, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dense sand in the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16, see, and he said unto the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. The devastation will be so much fall on us. It's like people are walking in the mine. And there are walls of uh, that mine, and they are down below, and something is happening on the surface. And it's so terrible that they're wishing that the wall of the mine, of the place, they're digging something, will fall on them and bury them there. It will be so terrible that the kings of the earth, and the princes of the earth, and the great men, and the free men, and the slaves, and everybody, young and old, and poor and rich, and the enlightened and uneducated, that they will want to go into the rocks of the, and the mountains and they will tell the rocks and the mountains fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and look at this, look at this and the rose from the rose of the Lamb from the wrath of the Lamb. Uh, the, the time of the great tribulation will be a time of wrath. The wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb. And then in verse 17, it says, For the great day of His wrath has come. The time of the great tribulation is the day of wrath. It's a period of wrath. And it says, For the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? But let me show you something. On the one hand, the wrath of God is poured on the earth. On the other hand, even Satan comes with devastating wrath. We're looking at Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in heaven. Look at that. Rejoice ye heavens. What's that? Ye angels of God in heaven rejoice, and ye living creatures in heaven rejoice, and ye that dwell in heaven. Who are those? Those are the people who are raptured already. They are raptured. They are taken away from this world. They are in heaven, and then the voice is saying, rejoice because you are not on earth. At the time of the wrath of God, rejoice because you are not on the earth. You have been raptured. You have been taken to heaven. Ye that dwell in them, in the heavens, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, not only Jewish people, not only a section of, of, of society, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, having great wrath, because he knows that is that, but a short time, the wrath of God on the world at the time of the great tribulation, the wrath of the Lamb on the, on the world at the time of the great tribulation, and the wrath of the devil, when all those uh, witchy wrath and anger come together, I pray you'll not be here at such a time. We're spoken about the prophecy of the great tribulation. We're spoken about the peculiarity of the great tribulation. How about the period? For what period will it be? I told you a little of that when we read from Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 when it says for one week, which means seven. But in the middle of the week, the Antichrist will break his covenant, his league with the children of Israel. Three and a half years of the beginnings of sorrow 
sorrows and then three and a half years of real great tribulation. Let's come to Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 20, the period of the great tribulation. And except the, that the Lord has shortened those days, except the Lord has moderated those days, except the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. You understand? It says the affliction will be so much. The pain will be so much. If it goes on for such an unlimited time, no flesh shall be saved. Anyone on earth at that time will experience such trouble and such famine and such peculiar plague that if they see the period were not shut in, no flesh shall be saved. But for the elect's sake, for those elect, the children of Israel, that the Lord said, I've not finished with you yet, and a remnant of the children of Israel will be saved because of them he has, that he has chosen, he has shortened those days. He has shortened those days. Now when it says he has shortened those days, uh, to what time, to what period? You know, we'll be referring to Daniel because Daniel spoke about the great tribulation period. Let's come back to Daniel again in Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 25. Daniel chapter 7, we're looking at a verse uh, 25. It tells us in verse 25, and it shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and seek to change times and laws. I want to change the commandments of God. I want to alter the Bible, the Word of God. I want to deface the Word of God, the Bible. It will seem to change times and the laws. And they shall be given into a side. Look at this until a time. That means one year. And times, that's plus two years, three. And the dividing of time, three and a half years. The real intense period of the great tribulation. Remember now, the church is gone. The rapture has taken place. And then there's the beginning of sorrows. And then the latter part, the second part of the seven years, which is three and a half years, a time and times, and dividing of time will be a time of real great tribulation. Turn to Revelation chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 11. Reading from verse 2. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread, shall they tread on the foot forty and two months. Forty and two months. Twelve months in uh, in a year. Twelve, twelve, twelve. Uh, that's three years, thirty-six, plus six months, that's forty-two. 40 and 2 months. Look at verse 3 there. In verse 3 it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days close in sackcloth. The same three and a half years, if you multiply 360, because the year at that time, the year of Bible prophecy is 360. If you multiply that by three and a half, which is by seven over two, you are going to have uh, the same thing, 42 months, and you are going to have uh, three and a half years. It tells us in chapter 13 uh, of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13, uh, reading from verse 5, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies, and power was given unto him uh, to continue, look at this, power was given unto him 40 and two months. The same thing is talking about the period of that great tribulation, except the Lord had shortened those days unto that three and a half years, 42 months. No flesh shall be saved, 1,200 and, um, you know, 16, 30 days. Except the Lord had done that, no flesh shall be saved. Look at verse 6. It says in verse 6, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Remember them that dwell in heaven, those saints of God who have been taken away, you'll be there, I'll be 
in the air, rapture before the great tribulation, so that when the great tribulation is happening here in the world, you will not be here, I will not be here in Jesus' name. Now we're coming to point number three. In point number three, the activity of the savers for the great tyrant. We're reading from Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, we're reading from verse 21. There have been some activities of people, they'll be religious, and they will be super spiritual. They'll be going about, they will be using all means, and they'll be giving their own kind of prophecy. And they'll be showing some signs too about Jesus Christ as want us ahead of time. Look at verse 21. Then, if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. If anybody comes to you and he says, Lo, here is Christ, you will not believe him. Look at verse 22. It says in verse 22, For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders. Look at that. And shall show signs and wonders to seduce, to deceive to entice people that if it were possible, they'll receive even the very elect. If it were possible, even the elect. In verse 23, Jesus said, But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Now, all those people, false prophets, showing signs and wonders, they will be very active at that time. It will be as if, you know, religion has never spread like this before. They'll be in the village, they'll be in the city, they'll be in the offices, they'll be everywhere and they'll be going about doing this and that and they'll have the key in their hand to deceive people. There will be deception because of those signs and lying wonders. The activity of deceivers for the great tyrant. They'll be doing this for the great tyrant. They'll be doing this for the Antichrist. They'll be doing this for the oppressor that will come to oppress everyone on the earth at this time. As we look at those verses, let's think about three things. Number one, the dishonesty of seducers and latter day wolves. These are the wolves that will come in the latter days. But already they have started their activities now. It's like they're warming up. But the very central thing about them is their dishonesty. Look at that again in Mark chapter 13, verse 21. Then if any man shall say to you, Lo, he is, he, here is Christ, and alone, he is there, believe him not. Look at verse 22. In verse 22 it says, For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders. They shall show signs and wonders. They shall show signs and wonders. The people will wonder at. They say, I've been going to church. I've been going to synagogue. I've been going to sanctuary. I never saw wonders like this before. They'll open their mouth. They'll not be able to close their mouth because there will be signs and wonders. But look at this. Jesus said, it is to deceive. It is to entice, it is to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. The Lord actually called them wolves. Look at Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, reading here from verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And in the prophecy we're studying concerning the time of the great tribulation, that be this time the latter day wolves will come. And all they want to do is to deceive and to, and to seduce, but it will be in dishonesty. But look at verse 16. It says in verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, of figs, of thistles? Of th uh, of thistles. In verse 17, it says, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. In verse 18, it says, And a good tree 
cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. In verse 19 it says, for every, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit shall be hewn down, shall be cut down, and cast into the fire. And it tells us now how we know them and recognize them, wherefore by their fruits he shall know them. It's not going to make the application. So you understand? It's not just talking about trees and the forest. It's talking about people, the wolves and the latter wolves. It's, to, it's saying in verse 21, this is Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 22, it says, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have we cast out devils, and in thy name have we done many wonderful works. Look at verse 23. It says, but and then will I profess unto them those wolves, then will I profess unto them those deceivers, then will I profess unto them those seducers, then will I profess unto them I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Ye that work iniquity. And it's at the time of the end that this sin will become more pronounced. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. The prophets have spoken expressly. The Lord Jesus Christ had spoken expressly at this time now, at the period of the church, in coming to want the church, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth is speaking expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, given heed to seduce spirits, spirits that entice, spirits that deceive, and spirits that seduce. It says they'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then in verse 2, it tells us in verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I pray you will not be deceived. You'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. You'll be ready for the rapture in Jesus' name. Look at, uh, you know, their deception. We're coming back to Mark chapter 13. In Mark chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. Mark chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. The deceitfulness in signs and lying wonders. There's some people that think, well, signs a sign supernatural it is something superhuman and because no human being can do this this must be coming from God don't be deceived it says in Mark chapter 13 verse 22 for false Christs and false prophets these words are coming out of the mouth of Christ himself it says he is the real one, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And yet there will be false prophets that will come, and false Christ that will come. And they will show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Do you remember when God sent Moses to Pharaoh and said, let my people go? And then Pharaoh said, what sign have you, have you shown? He threw the rod down and because I became a serpent. And Pharaoh said, wait. He called the deceivers. He called the false prophets. He called the magicians and said, look at what he has done. Duplicate that. And he threw the rod down, became also serpent. You see, there are people that can show signs. And you see, they're similar to the signs of Christ. And the signs of the people of God. And then another sign, uh, Moses uh, stretches rod, and all the waters and the land became blood. And the magician said, there's nothing we can duplicate that. And they turned water into blood as well. That's telling us of the deception of the signs and the lying wonders. In fact, it tells
chance or sin. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 9. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan and with all power and signs and lying wonders. You see that? With all uh, the walking, uh, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And then it says in verse 10, uh, in verse 10 it says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them uh, that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. There are people that are relegating salvation to the background. And you don't have the love for the truth. They have the love for the sensational, something that will tickle them, something you know, that will make them surprised. And they will say, look at this, look at that. And it's saying there are people like that. They are, they are deceived by unrighteousness and they will perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. In verse 11, it says in verse 11, and for this cause shall, uh, shall God send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Verse 12 says, it says that they all might be damned who believe not the truth and but add pleasure in unrighteousness. They believe not the truth, but they have pleasure in unrighteousness. I pray you will not be like that in Jesus' name. Now, if you look at verse 9 of this passage we're just read now, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. It mentions Satan there. What's the end of Satan? And what's the end of the people that are following after Satan, that are running after signs and wonders, all those uh, duplicities of the, of the devil that brings us to this uh, thought section now, the damnation of Satan? and lost wanderers. When somebody is wandering about, and somebody goes into a bush, into a forest, and he wanders into the forest, eventually he loses his way, and he cannot find his way back home again. The people who are wandering away into this, into that, into that, eventually you might be lost if you are wandering like that. When you know the truth is being preached, when you know the truth is being exposed, and when you know that the truth of the word of God from cover to cover, beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, is being revealed to us, why don't you stay? Why are you roaming about? If you are not careful, the wanderer can be lost eventually, and it's difficult to retrieve, it's difficult to recover that wanderer. And what's the destination of such people? The damnation of Satan and lost wanderers. It tells us, uh, we have read it already, in that second sentence, chapter 2, uh, reading from verse 9, uh, and now in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, uh, I'm reading from verse 41. Matthew 25, uh, reading from verse 41. It says, again, these are the words of Jesus. Then shall you say also unto them on the left hand, on the left and depart from me, ye curse into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The wanderers who wander about, they wander into error, they wander into false doctrine, they wander into the cave of the false prophets, they wander into the shrine of the deceivers, they wander into the class of the seducers, those who wander about and they are lost, the, the Lord will say, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We're told in Jude chapter 1, 
Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, wandering angels, the angels that did not stay, did not stand, did not remain in their first estate, in the place where the Lord had put them, and they wandered, wandered, wandered about, and they became lost into the hands of Satan, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Let their own habitation. Those are wanderers. I pray you'll not be a wanderer. You'll not leave your own habitation. And then the night has come and there's no street light. You don't know your way back home. You've wandered away so far. You cannot find your way back to the sanctuary of the believers, to the congregations of the righteous ones. You've left your, your own habitation. He has reserved in everlasting chase under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. It tells us in verse 12 of that Jude, it says, These are spots in your feast of charity. When the feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, and it says, Clouds that are without water, carried about of winds, whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the rules. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, Reaching waves of the sea. It says, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, wandering stars, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness for long, forever. If you look at Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, we're looking at verse 10. Look at this, something peculiar here. It says, the devil which deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. The devil which deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Where the beast and the false prophet are, the beast and the pro false prophet, there was Satan, there was the devil in that lake of fire and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, uh, that's the last verse of that chapter, it says, And whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Compare those two verses. Verse 10 says, The devil which deceived them and the beast and the false prophet, were, they were cast into the lake of fire. They are tormented forever and ever. And then it says in the final verse, in verse 15, it says, Whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into that same lake of fire where the devil is and the beast and the false prophet. The, Paul, the uh, lost wanderers, they are with Satan. They'll be with Satan forever and ever. You will not be with Satan. You will not be with Satan. You will not go with Satan. You will not be lost with Satan in Jesus' name. In conclusion, my brother, in conclusion, my sister, what are we to do? Well, Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, we're reading from verse 34. In Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 34, take heed to yourselves during this time now when we're not able to gather together and the, 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 the district pastor cannot see you, cannot easily get to you, and he doesn't know whether you are there on Monday, whether you are there on Thursday, whether you are there on Sunday. At this time now, when maybe our group pastors are not able to reach everybody, they're reaching some, and they're calling us, but they're not able to reach some. When our state overseers are reaching overseers, when we cannot see ourselves face to face, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter there, take care to yourselves, lest at any time, at such a special time like this, your hearts be overcharged with sufficient and drunkenness. Now when you say sufficient and drunkenness, it doesn't mean that we are drinking alcohol, we are drinking palm wine, we are drinking this and that. There are some activities that make people drunk. 
my brother, my sister, there are things that make people just forget themselves. And we who are students, at the time we should have the online classes and be linking up with our studies so that life goes on regularly. Instead of that, we're surfing over the internet and looking at this and looking at that and we become addicted to those things and we abandon our studies. At this time now, take good care of yourself. Lest at any time your hands be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life so that they come upon you unawares in verse 35. It says in verse 35, verses near shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Verse 36, my brother, my sister, my child there, watch ye therefore. And pray always that she may be accounted worthy. God will count you worthy. You will escape. You will not suffer the devastation of the great tribulation in Jesus' name. That she may be able to, that she may be accounted worthy to escape all this thing that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We're waiting for Christ as Savior. We're waiting for the Redeemer. He will come. The trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so shall we. And so shall you. And so shall I. And so shall you and I be with the Lord forever and ever. Let's comfort each other. Encourage each other with all these things we're learning. And then motivate each other to love God more with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind that will be ready for that final day in Jesus' name. You'll be ready? Amen. I'll be ready? Amen. And we'll see you once again at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer thanking God for what he has taught us today, telling us what the people of the world do not, uh, do not know. They do not know that a time of the great tribulation is coming, but God has revealed this infallible prophecy unto you and unto me. Let's make good use of what God has revealed. He loves us and he has exposed this, the future event unto us. Remember, the abomination of desolation will come but you will not be here in Jesus' name. Tell the Lord, make sure that your salvation is there so that you will take part in the glorious translation so that rapture, you will not miss that rapture in Jesus' name. Remember, the fire came upon Sodom and Gomorrah, but Lord went out of Sodom before the fire descended. Remember that Noah and the family were in the ark, safe and secured before the waters, the deluge of the flood came upon the world at that time. So the church will be taken away and you are part of that church, saved and sanctified, holy and righteous. Pray that God will give you the grace to remain to abide. You will not be lost in Jesus' name. And when the abomination shall take place in this world, when the desolation shall take place in this world, you will not be here in Jesus' name. Watch and take heed so that the Lord himself will preserve you and take care of you and the affliction beyond description that will come at the time of the great revelation will not be upon you. The prophecy is sure. The prophecy is certain. The peculiarity of that time cannot be said. Nobody can say that that will not happen. The wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb, and the wrath of the devil will be poured upon the world at such a time. It will be such a period of intense tribulation, intense trouble, and intense affliction. But the Lord is telling us that we will not be wondrous. I will not wonder you will not wander, will not be roaming about, so that we will not be lost with Satan to spend eternity with Satan at such a time in Jesus' name. Now we have the real wonder of Christ. We have all the power of Christ working with us and working for us, and we have the promises of God. Why will I be foolish? Why will you be foolish to roam about and then become 
become a lost wanderer, God forbid, you will not be a lost wanderer in Jesus. You must make up your mind, you will abide, you will stay, and that day will not come upon you unawares in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the revelation of your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for this prophecy of events still to come in the latter days. We are praying, Lord, as you have opened our eyes, you will cleanse our heart, you will wash our heart, and you will make us to abide with you at, uh, all the time. In Jesus' name, we will not wander away. We will not stray away. We will not depart from your truth. We will not depart from the sound doctrine of your word and from the real definite Christian experiences you have given in us, Lord, the grace to abide, the strength to abide, the determination to abide, and the, for the uh, backbone to stand. We pray that you give to every one of your children, of your people in Jesus' name. If there are backsliders, oh Lord, I pray that your loving spirit will draw them back home, back home to Calvary, back home to the presence of the Lord in Jesus' name. If there are those who are discouraged and those who are depressed and those who are in need I pray Lord in your love you get them back so that they will not be running after things that will destroy their lives but they will stay and abide with the Lord faithfully until the end in Jesus we are praying Lord that when that rapture will take place what will be any moment from now every one of your children every one of us those who have listened to Bible study and those who are your children they are not able to uh, congregate with us now, but we are going to touch their lives and remind them uh, of these days coming. You will keep everyone faithful and ready for that time uh, in Jesus' name. Reveal your love and reveal your power to everyone, Lord, and let your spirit make us stable, waiting, ready for the coming of the Lord. We well, thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. We welcome you to the Bible study tonight. And I pray we'll have a wonderful time together in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for your people. Thank you for fathers, mothers, children, boys and girls. Thank you for everyone, Lord. Thank you for the interest you have given us to study with you, to hear your words, and to hear the declarations you have made concerning the end time events. We are asking, Lord, that tonight you open our eyes of understanding and you give us the heart to take in, the heart to receive, and the heart and the mind to be prepared to do your will, so we'll be ready for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. As you know, we've been studying from Mark chapter 13. And the answer of the Lord Jesus Christ, which eventually has now revealed to us the event, events of the last days, that answer came as a result of the question that the disciples had asked. Actually, the Lord Jesus Christ had been talking to them about his days. He has spoken to them about his resurrection. And he has spoken recently to them about the destruction of the temple. And he said, no stone will be left upon another. They will see everything collapsing. Everything will totally crumble and come down. And then he spoke about his coming again. And spoke about the end of the world. I've told you already that that came as a surprise to them. And so now they came to ask the question privately, intimately, when he was alone with his own disciples, outsiders were not there. Pharisees were not there. Sadducees were not there. These were the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who wanted to know. And he said, tell us, when shall these things be? And when will be the end of the world and the sign of your coming? 
And that's what we have been looking at in the various uh, parts of the answer that he gave to them. Today, we're looking at Mark chapter 13, verse 14, all through to verse 23. And today, the Lord mentioned himself, the great tribulation. And we're looking at Christ's infallible prophecy of the great tribulation. Number one, it's a prophecy. It's something that has not happened. It's something that will happen. And because it will happen, that's why it is prophecy. It is infallible because it is unchangeable. It is, not, it is something that nothing can change. No man and no power, no evil, no Satan. And even God will not change this. It's a time that will come. That's why it's called the infallible prophecy and it is from Christ and he is the personification of the truth. He told the truth, he said the truth and now let us look at uh, this passage where we're studying from verse 14 to verse 23 at the beginning I'll just select some verses for us to read. Look at verse 14 now. It says in verse 14, but when he shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand, standing where it ought not to stand, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. The Lord Jesus Christ brought the prophecy of the past that Daniel spoke about this. He said, Daniel the prophet, he spoke about the abomination of desolation. And he said, when you see the people who live in the world at that time, when they shall see, it says, he that readeth, let him understand. He that readeth, that means it's, it, it's not just the disciples. He that will read about this, he that readeth what we're learning now, let him take note and let him know that that time is very near. I'm reading from verse 19 now. In verse 19, as Jesus con uh, continued, he said, For in those days, he's talking about the days of the affliction, the days of the great tribulation, the days that are still coming. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which, the, which God created until this time, neither shall be. It talks about the affliction, it talks about the suffering, and it talks about the great tribulation that is to come. And there's something peculiar about that great tribulation. It is something that had never been such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created until this time. And then he said, neither shall be. That means that it will happen, it will be the height of suffering, and the height of pain, and the height of sorrows, and the height of affliction. And that's what we are talking about, Christ's infallible prophecy of the great tribulation. Today we're dividing the message to three parts. Uh, number one is the abomination of desolation after the glorious translation. You understand? There's going to be a, tr a glorious translation. Translation means the Lord is going to catch us away. He's going to take us away. The, the term for that, technical term for that, is the rapture. But the rapture is the glorious translation and the abomination of desolation that will happen. Notice this word, after, after after the glorious translation. Point number two, the affliction beyond description during the great tribulation. After the rapture has taken place, after the glorious translation has taken place, after the saints, after the church has gone, after the bride of Christ has been removed from this world, that's the glorious translation, after the ambassadors of Christ have been taken away from this world, that's the glorious translation, then there will be the great tribulation. That great tribulation will be a time of affliction beyond description, beyond what had ever happened and what will ever happen. Point number two, the affliction beyond description during the great tribulation. Point number three now is the activity of deceivers for the great tyrants. During the great tribulation, a tyrant 
a king of a wicked personality will arise. It's called the Antichrist. And there will be deceivers, there will be seducers, there will be people that will be prophesying and walking this and walking that by the power of the devil. And that devil, that Satan, that Antichrist is referred to now as the great tyrant. And the activities of those uh, people that will be working for him is point number three, the activity of deceivers for the great tyrant. Let's come back to number one. In point number one, this is the abomination of desolation after the glorious translation. The abomination of desolation after the glorious translation. Now, we need to think very well in a logical way, systematic way, scriptural way. And we're talking, number one, about the ascension. Ascension is when something goes up, when someone goes up. Like when Jesus Christ was talking to his disciples, and then he was lifted up, and he went up. We call that the ascension of Christ. That ascension is going to happen to the old church, to the church of the saints of God. That's the rapture. That's the rapture, the catching away, the taking up of the children of God, of the saints of God, the ascension that will happen before the devastation. Number two, then we'll see in this section the abomination of desolation. Then we'll see number three, the admonition for escaping damnation. Why are we studying? Why are we here? Why are you reading your Bible? Why are you studying your Bible? Why do we want to know about the things that Christ has said so that we'll escape? And so that will not be part of the people that will suffer in the great tribulation when that great tribulation will take place. That's why we need to, as we talk about the rapture, you want to take part in the rapture. As we talk about the abomination, you just want to be enlightened so that when that desolation, damnation will come upon this world, you will escape. Thank God you are going to escape. Saved, you will escape. Sanctified, you will escape. And standing steadfast in the will of God, in the mind of God, you will escape in Jesus in the admonition for escaping damnation. And let's run through very quickly. Number one, the ascension before the devastation. As you look at Luke chapter 21, here is what Jesus Christ told his own disciples, and here is what Jesus Christ is telling us. In Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 34, he said, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with self-eating. And look at what the Lord is saying. He said, As you hear about the events that will come, about the things that will happen at the end of this world, don't just shrug your shoulders and just say, Okay, whatever will happen, will happen. If uh, trouble is coming, tribulation is coming, if suffering is coming, affliction is coming, then what will happen? Will happen? He says, no, don't have that nonchalant attitude. You must take it yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. There will be people who just carry on life, uh, you know, they don't understand that rapture is going to happen. They are not waiting for anything. They are not careful about anything. They are not praying specifically. And they are not preparing themselves specifically. And they are not standing firm in the conviction that they are waiting for the coming of the Lord. And the Lord is saying, don't do that. Don't be nonchalant and don't be careless. Take heed unto yourself. Look at verse 35 of that uh, Luke chapter 21. It says, For as is near shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. This is not a localized thing that will happen. The desolation that will come, the devastation that will come, the destruction that will come is not a localized thing. It will come like a snare suddenly upon all them that dwell on the face of the earth. But the Lord has told us in verse 36, in verse 36 it says, What she therefore because many people will be unprepared, because many people will not be ready. It says, you, my child, you, my servant, it says, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may, may be accounted worthy to escape 
all these things that shall come to pass and then to stand before the Son of Man. The rapture is going to take place before the devastation, before the abomination, before the rule of the Antichrist. It is very interesting. Look at Luke chapter 17, verse 29. In Luke chapter 17, verse 29, the Lord says, like it happened, at the time of Lord, it says that same day that Lord went out of Sodom, that same day that Lord went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Please understand, Lord went out of Sodom before the fire of God's wrath and God's judgment came upon Sodom. The church will leave this place. The church will leave the earth, will be translated, will be raptured, will be cut up, will be taken away before the Antichrist will come to rule over the world here. The Lord will not allow the Antichrist to rule over his bride. You understand? The Lord will not allow that devastation to come while his ambassadors are still here, while the church is still here. And it says, the same day that Lord went out of Sodom, and it's after that it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them. Look at verse 30 and look at what the Lord is saying. It says, even thus, even in the same way shall it be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. It's very clear then that the rapture will take place before the devastation. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It says, We shall not all die. We shall not all be in the grave. We shall not all be resting in the grave, but we shall all be changed. In verse 52, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in corruption. That's the time of the rapture. There will be a resurrection. And then the rapture now. And we shall be changed. We've read this before. Just to refresh your memory in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 14. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we believe that, don't you? That's how you were saved. You believe that Jesus Christ died for you and that he rose again for your salvation, for your justification. And because we believe that, that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He is coming. And he says, the Lord Almighty God will bring with him the people that sleep in the dust. Look at verse 15. It says, verse 15, for we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive, believers, saints, children of God, saved and sanctified, holy and ready for the coming of the Lord. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive, alive in Christ, alive in righteousness, alive as new creatures in Christ, and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them, shall not precede them, shall not hinder them, which are asleep. And then in verse 16 it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, this prophetic, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then in verse 17, glorious translation, it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, will be caught up will be translated, we will ascend, we will go up and to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Look at verse 18 there. In verse 18 it says, Therefore comfort one another, 
if we're going to go through the great tribulation, there's no comfort in that. If the abomination of desolation is going to meet us there, there's no, uh, there's no uh, comfort in that. If we're going to go through the same affliction that the people of the world, that the unbelievers, that those who are serving Satan, if they, we're going to go through the same thing with them, there's no comfort in that. But because we're waiting for the coming of the Lord, we're waiting for the rapture. And when the rapture takes place and we're gone, that's only when the devastation, the destruction, the abomination can come upon this world. That's why we have the comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's come back to Mark now, chapter 13, verse 14. In Mark chapter 13, verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. And he's saying, after we have gone, there will be the abomination of desolation. You know desolation? That's devastation. You know desolation? That's destruction. You know desolation? That's like taking something good, something beautiful, tearing to pieces, making everything to crumble, destroying everything you know, until there is nothing good that people of the world will be living for. It says in Mark chapter 13, verse 14, it says, But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, the very language of Jesus Christ, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The prophet, who is the prophet? A prophet is someone that God reveals what is going to happen to, and he declares that, and because it is a word coming from God, we cannot miss it. It will not be missed. It will happen. And he says, it's spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and it will stand where it ought not. The abomination will stand where it ought not. What does that mean? You see, when you collect something dirty, and you take it to the dustbin, that's uh, taking something that is dirty to a place dedicated for dirty things. But when you take something uh, that is dirty, something defiled, uh, the, the defilement that came out of uh, the animal or uh, 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 came out of man, and then you take that to be in the palace, in the throne of the king of the city. That's abomination. And it is standing, and it is being placed where it should not be. And what uh, Daniel was speaking about is that abomination of desolation, that should not that is standing where it ought not that means devastation that means abominable things that means what god hates when that stands in the temple of god where it should not be when that stands in the throne of the king where it should not be it says then take it and understand what you are reading understand that is what Daniel spoke about very quickly. Let's look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And you'll see what uh, Daniel mentioned. And you'll see what Jesus Christ is referring to in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Please open your Bible and underline so that when you read later and when you want to teach other people to you, you will know where the passage is in your Bible. It says, and it shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That one week just means in the original one seven. That is a unit of seven. What does that mean? Actually seven years. It says, and in the midst of the week, in the midst of the seven, in the middle of those seven years, it shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. You understand that? It will say, there's no other God you are worshipping. There's no other God you are sacrificing to. There's no other God you are praying to. Therefore, stop all that. It will stop the sacrifices of the Jews. It will stop the offering of the Jews for the overspreading. Listen to this now. Of the abominations. It will spread dirty things. It will spread evil things. Unacceptable things. 
in the, on the altar of God. And it says, it shall make it desolate. You see that abominations that will make desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. If you look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 3. I've already explained to you that that abomination of desolation is when something dirty, something unacceptable, a, a wicked personality, an evil personality comes to sit at the very altar of the Lord. And he wants to displace God. That's the abomination of desolation in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. You understand? When people are falling away from the truth, and they don't care for the truth, there may be church, but there's no truth. There may be assembly, but there's no truth. And people are used to just telling stories. And they're not used to delving into the Bible, going into the Word of God. And they're used to just hearing whatever the man, the preacher, the priest wants to say. And it's a falling away from the truth. And the people have not heard the truth for so many years. Even when you tell them error, even when you expose them to error, there's, there's nothing they can do because they do not know the difference. That time, you know, is already here in the world. That day shall not come except until there come a falling away force and that man of sin. That man of sin, that's talking about the Antichrist, that's talking about the tyrant, that's talking about Satan incarnate, that's talking about the one that will totally be controlled by Satan, and it's a man of sin, a man of Satan, a man of evil. It says, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. What will he do? What will he do? This is the abomination. Look at verse 4. Who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination. When you take that dirty, defiled personality, and then he sits at the very seat of God, and then he calls the people, everyone, to worship him. And if they will not worship him, he will compel them. That's the abomination of desolation. Look at Revelation chapter 13. We're reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 6. It says, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. You see that? There's somebody who comes to uh, the church of the living God. He comes to the seat of the living God. He comes to the throne of the living God. He comes to the altar of the living God. And he opens his mouth against the God of heaven to blaspheme his name and to blaspheme his tabernacle, and to blaspheme them that dwell in heaven. That's the abomination of desolation. My prayer for you is that you will not be in the world at such a time in Jesus' name. Let me hear your amen. You'll not be here at that time in Jesus' name. If you're not going to be here at that time, what's the admonition the Lord is giving us? And what's the Lord telling us how to escape that kind of abomination, that desolation, that destruction, that deception, and that damnation? Uh, we look at Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 15. The admonition for escaping damnation. The admonition for escaping damnation. It tells us in chapter 13 of Mark, verse 15, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of the house. It's talking actually to the people that will be here at such a time. I pray you'll not be here. But you know, as we apply that to ourselves, it's saying that as God has brought you to the mountain top of light, to the mountain top of the gospel, to the mountain top of redemption, to the mountain top of righteousness, to the mountain top of salvation, sanctification, 
and the power and the strength of the Lord as we see the world crumbling, as we see the world going down the drain, as we see all righteous principles being overturned. You are at the top. Don't calm down. Don't backslide. Don't look down. And don't look behind you. Look at verse 16. It says in verse 16, and let him that is in the field not turn back again to take up his garment. He's saying to the people that will live at that time that if they hear that something has happened in the city, the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem, and the Antichrist is occupying the seat where God ought to occupy, and is blaspheming the name of God in them the field. Let them not come back to the place where they were before because affliction was, will start in a devastating, destructive manner. What's that saying to you and to me? Well, the field of evangelism, well, the field of working for God, and we hear that this is happening, this is happening, that's not the time to come back and say, you know, nightclub and drinking and merriment and picnic, because now we know the time is near, and we're not going to allow anything to disengage us and to make us leave the work he has given us today in verse 17. It says in verse 17, but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Why? Is it a crime to have a child, a crime to be pregnant? Not, not at all. He's talking about such a time when the Antichrist will uh, take over and then when food will be measured, when you will not be able to take this and buy this except to take the mark of the Antichrist. And even if you could endure an hunger by yourself, if you could endure the famine by yourself, and you say, I will take my stand, what about the baby that is crying all the time? I need something to eat. And if that, if that child is going to get what to eat, then you have to take the mark of the beast. And once you take that mark, it's all over. That means that the destruction will come. That's why it says, be ready now, so you will not be in the world at such a time. My brother, my sister, if there's anything that should occupy our attention, it is being ready at this time. It says in verse 18, in verse 18 it says, and pray that your flight be not in the winter. Your flight be not when it will be so very cold in the land of Israel, and sometimes so cold like the winter, biting cold, that they will not be able to move out, they will not be able to run, even if there is devastation, abomination, even if there is uh, damnation going on, and they wanted to escape, they will not be able to escape, but well, I'm praying for you, you will not be here at such a time. You will be ready in Jesus' name. Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 42. Matthew Chapter 24, reading from verse 42. It says, Watch therefore, watch therefore, watch over your life, watch over the Christian experience you have, watch over the title, and watch over your ticket, and watch over your qualifications, spiritual qualification that will take you to heaven. Don't be so careless and throw it aside and be looking for other things. Watch it therefore. For ye know not what hour the Lord does come. In verse 44, in verse 44, it says, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as she think not the Son of Man cometh. Be ye also ready. I pray you'll be ready in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two is the affliction beyond description during the great tribulation. Now the church is gone. Now the saints are raptured. Now the believers have gone from here. And now the great tribulation is going to happen. And you need to understand, number one, the prophecy of the great tribulation is prophetic. And it is there, and it is unchangeable, unalterable, the prophecy of the great tribulation.